Good evening. I'm Karen Klein. I'm a founding partner at Bloomberg Beta. And at my first VC event, I was standing in line for a payphone. So yes, it was a little while ago. And I, was, I looked around the room and I saw a sea of suits, um, men in business suits, and I was surprisingly the only female VC. So tonight, the good news is the number of VCs in the room has tripled, <laughs> or over tripled, and um, that's very encouraging. We certainly have a long way to go, but um, it's exciting and very promising. At, at Bloomberg Beta, we invest in seed stage companies that are making work better. And when we think about the future of work, the future of work is diverse. And the reason for that is only logical that people make much better decisions when there's diverse input. So tonight, what's going to be exciting is I, I love VC because we get to work with founders who want to change the world. And you're going to get to hear perspectives from three talented VCs. And I'm going to invite them to come out. Um, we have, uh, first up, well, Scarlett uh, Fu is going to uh, moderate the panel. And she is a wonderful um, Bloomberg anchor. So Scarlett, are you going to come up first? I guess so. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have Rebecca Caden from Union Square Ventures. <laughs> and Ellie Wheeler from Graycroft. And Beth Ferreira uh, from Firstmark. I'm really excited uh, for them to share an inside look on venture capital. So I turn it over to Scarlett. Thank you. OK. We have Rebecca Caden of Union Square Ventures, Ellie Wheeler of Graycroft Partners, and Beth Ferrer of Firstmark. I want to start with your backstory, how you got to where you are right now, because I think that's where we all want to start. We all want to figure out the story behind your story. Um, your professional journey, Rebecca, is interesting because you started off in media. You yes. worked at The Economist in London, then yep. you moved to San Francisco for a startup publication. You went to business school. VC was not even on your radar at all until your mentor recommended it. Yeah, so I, I grew up here in New York City um, and wanted to be a journalist and pursued that through school um, and after school. And it brought me out to San Francisco um, eventually to um, join a startup publication. They were really on the editorial side. And I had gotten interested while at this publication on how they were ever going to make money and kind of the, the tough, tricky, but interesting problem of um, content online and the intersection of um, news and, and technology. Um, went to business school from there and really did not know what I was going to do, uh, but thought I would probably join a you know big tech company, learn what that's like, kind of continue this journey of getting to know um, the tech industry. And a close mentor of mine while I was at business school was a guy named Bill Campbell, who um, passed away a couple of years ago, but um, was really a, an amazing figure in Silicon Valley and a big inspiration to me because he was really known for um, being a coach. Um, and he actually started his career as a football coach at Columbia, which is this interesting kind of narrative. But he became this kind of uh, career coach in Silicon Valley. And he mostly coached really important people, <laughs> um, Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt and things like that. But he had this like side gig-ish of being involved with Stanford and um, kind of mentoring some people there like me, all the way on the other end of the spectrum, who were just starting out in their careers and had really no idea what they were going to do. And after a lot of conversation with him, um, he was the one who suggested, hey, I think you should go into VC. I think you would um, really like it, and it would fit with your curiosity and people interest. And he was a close advisor to a firm in, in the Bay Area called Maveron, where I would go on to spend about six years before moving over to Union Square. So it was, um, it was very serendipitous and not planned, but um, what I learned from it was largely about the role of mentorship and uh, the ability of certain people in that advisory role to sometimes see in people what they can't see in themselves or no answers for them that they can't see in themselves. And uh, that comes back to me a lot, and I, I try to remember it. 
I like how you said about how it's not planned because Ellie, you had planned, you had big plans. You went to medical school, um, and you switched at some point to private equity out of medical school. So that's an interesting pivot right there. Then you went to Cisco and eventually moved on to Harvard Business School, uh, where in searching for your next job or the job out of uh, B school, you tweeted with someone or responded to a tweet and got a job. Uh, yeah, all of that's true. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the takeaway from mine is that there isn't one path, right? It's not first you do this for two years and then you get into a private equity firm or a hedge fund. It's not something formulaic like that. Um, and obviously mine wasn't. I didn't know what venture was. I did. I was pre-med. I actually went to med school. Most people figure it out during organic chemistry. I went a lot farther. Um, but I did drop out right before finals of first semester. So I, you know, I still knew pretty quickly. Um, and I, from there, ended up going to a private equity firm in Boston. So that was an immersive experience. Uh, learned a little bit about a lot of things and primarily realized that the financial side of it, the you know what half a turn of leverage does to IRR in five years, I just didn't care about. Um, so ended up going to Cisco. That was my tech immersion. I moved out to the West Coast, came back um, to HBS for business school. And yeah, I worked with um, Chris Sacco as an angel investor out West um, for a little bit during business school and you know did an independent study around the rise of seed VC, which at the time was still called micro VC or super angels. Like it was something that didn't really even exist. This wasn't that long ago. And now it's just accepted as truth that it's, it's an asset class in and of itself. But, um, and that was via Twitter. Um, so that, that part was true too. And then I ended up joining Graycroft um, immediately after business school. And I've been there since. So it's been about seven years. And Beth, uh, you were planning for this route, you could say, in that you went to UPenn uh, for undergrad, you went to Penn for business school as well. You were working as a banker, and Ellie mentioned something about how she learned what she didn't want to do um, with her first stint in private equity. When you were a banker, you worked with older, more established companies where you were helping them raise money through equity sales, debt sales, and you realized that that's not what you want to do. That is true. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, the time in banking was great from a skills perspective. But the la one of the last deals I worked on was an earlier stage company that was raising debt instead of equity. And it was the first time I had worked with a, f a founding team that was energized and was thinking about big things and were you know, working all the time. And I, you know, they, this was a company based in St. Louis. I flew out there, spent a week with them, helped them <coughs> build their business plan and their financial model. And that was sort of the big wake up call of like, I want to do this. And so I came back to, and I was based in New York. I came back to New York and I was looking at, um, the, the startup landscape, and I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to work at a startup. And in that process of doing that research, I found a firm called Flatiron Partners who was investing in these kinds of companies. And I sent them a blind cover letter, um, basically outlining what I thought I could do for them, which basically was not actually what they needed, but it was <laughs> a nice <laughs> attempt. And um, one of the partners responded to, to, to my note. And um, we started a conversation over six months, ended up getting hired. Um, and so that was an amazing ride. Um, it was um, during the dot-com boom. So um, I joined in 98, and we saw like a huge rise. And we went, and we like the investment pace accelerated. And then it came to a screeching halt in 2001. And so we saw the other side and learned a lot about bankruptcy and um, all kinds of things that you hoped you never <laughs> learn about from a venture capital perspective. Um, the other thing that happened was um, the entire uh, venture industry contracted by almost half. And so you're looking around, and many of my friends you know, sort of lost their seat. And eventually, I lost my seat um, in venture, and which was sort of the impetus for going back to school. So I, you know, I, I, sit I sat there, and I was like, all right, I have two post-MBA jobs before business school. I'd never go back to business school. But you never know, say never. It was, it was a great reset. Went to business school, came out. and went into business school with a thesis. Um, at the time, many of the really well-known venture capitalists had operating experience. Um, and I thought that would be something that I'd be interested in exploring. So on the other side of business school, um, I did that. And I was an operator for about a decade. So um, joined Etsy early. I was the 12th employee who was there to see um, significant scale, almost 12, 20x in the time that I was there, and then did it again at a company called Fab.com that grew faster, um, obviously didn't have the outcome we were hoping, but um, 
also scaled. So to put it in perspective, when I walked in the door, we were shipping 500 units a day. Um, within 18 months, we were shipping over 25,000 units a day. So a lot of growth. Um, and then after that, sort of had a second wave of thinking about operating versus venture. And I had that sort of in my mind as I was thinking about it. So from the venture perspective, um, you know, what would be um, sort of the path that I take? So I started a fund with mm -hmm. WMEIMG and did that for a few years and now joined FirstMark. So you mentioned the dot-com bubble and bust and how that was kind of pivotal. Did the financial crisis hurt or help you at that stage of your career, the 2008, 2009 the one? Oh, so the interesting thing is I joined Etsy in 2007, and most of my business school classmates thought I was absolutely insane. There was a, it was a craft startup that no one ever heard of in Brooklyn, <laughs> and <laughs> which wasn't, it wasn't capitalized very well either. We had like a couple million invested capital, and you know, they all had their fancy hedge fund and banking jobs or whatever, and then fast forward to 2008, almost all of them were unemployed. So I was like looking, you know, at least I had my job at that point. So, and I was on a you know, fast growing startup, so it was, it was actually well timed on the second time around. So first crisis, not so great, second crisis, much better. Ellie, you were at Cisco during the financial crisis, right? So you got to see things from that perspective as a company that was looking to make acquisitions. Right, exactly. So I was in corporate development at Cisco, so that's M&A venture strategy on the enterprise software side. And um, for me, it ended up being great because we had 30 some odd billion dollars on the balance sheet and otherwise liquidity had completely dried up. Mm -hmm. So everything came through the door. So from in terms of the learning experience, it was as good as it could have been. Um, obviously, there were a lot of other things that were, were challenging in the ecosystem, but in, in the seat that I was in, it was great. We talk about operator versus investor, or Beth did at least. She's, <coughs> she, she has both sides of that experience. Rebecca, do you think that uh, being an operator gives you an advantage as, a, as an investor? Do you have to have run a business to have an advantage in picking which businesses to invest in? You know, it's a, so this is a popular question, and I think it's one that's talked a lot about in VC. You, there's data behind it. Um, you know, you can look at some of the best investors of our time. And operators are, are represented. They're in the mix. But we also have, you know, Bill Gurley, Fred Wilson, Mike Moritz, who are not investors and, in fact, come from a, a varied background. And I think the learning there is there isn't one path here. Um, and there isn't one answer to how you um, become a, a great VC. And that's because the skill set that's required here, in addition to a fair amount of luck along the way, um, doesn't match up with a career path that came before it. I think it matches up uh, with different things depending on the stage you're at. But for you know the three of us, um, a lot of people skill, a lot of uh, understanding of markets, a lot of being in the right place at the right time, a lot of relationship building. And does some of that come from operating? Sure. Can some of that come from other things as well? Sure, it's always surprised me how actually weirdly similar journalism is to, to venture in some ways, and also totally different. How, you know, you know, Bill Gurley may be one of the best kind of analysts of our time and how he thinks about markets, and clearly that's, you know, played out for him. So I, I take a pretty broad view of what can lead to kind of great outcomes on the venture side. Well, you talk about luck, you talk about um, the markets overall. Ellie, I wonder where we are in the startup VC cycle and how that compares to uh, the broader stock market, the broader economy. I mean, the job market's really strong right now. The economy's doing well. So do we presume that VC is doing well and we'll follow that trajectory? So it's a little bit different. Um, as, you know, as interest rates have been as low as they have, more and more money has come into venture. And that causes all sorts of other things. Um, so what you've seen is a tremendous amount of capital at the later stages. Um, you've seen a delay in things going public because they don't have to. Right. And you've seen a lot of people who used to play in the later stage game come earlier and everyone else subsequently also go earlier. Um, so what we've had is probably a, a few vintages that might be really awful over time. Who knows? Um, it's the, we're in a business where feedback cycles are 10 years long. So we won't know for a little while. Um, you know, what these things are going to look at. What I can say is that since, tw you know, late 2014, early 2015, we've been talking about how there's going to be a correction. So it's, it's also like if you predict it often enough, eventually you're right. Um, there's a <laughs> lot of like that, that going around. Um, yeah, it's like you predicted the last 18 recessions, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of that happening. I mean, prices have been high. There's a lot of capital. Um, and there's a lot of really awesome things happening. Um, but you know, venture, the venture ecosystem is such an oddity 
um, and really kind of a lagging indicator. Um, you know, what's going on in the stock market doesn't affect us today. It doesn't affect us for quite some time. The things we're investing in today are probably going to exit in seven to ten years, so it's rather irrelevant. Um, although you, of course, are thinking about generally how something's going to be valued, um, the two things are just, just pretty different. I mean, it's interesting when you think about pricing today, if you think about pricing versus three or four years ago, if you're coming in at 3x what you might have paid two or three years ago, you're probably not going to exit at 3x. And so that, that, those returns are going to get squeezed, yep. and we're just trying to figure out how do we get squeezed the least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, what do you think? How has the VC industry changed during your time in it, and how does it match up or not match up with what you're seeing in the broader economy? Well, I think um, there's a disconnect partly because of the time cycles that Ali was talking about. I do think it's evolved. Um, and that's a, it's a, it has a couple of reasons of why. One is the sheer amount of capital involved and in, that's coming into it, right? There's, so there's institutional VC, which are kind of the asset class that the three of us in our firms represent. But it's also become a word that means many different things, mm -hmm. some of which have nothing to do with each other, it's really. Yes. It's extremely yeah. broad. So now we call VC everything from strategics writing checks to things that have strategic impact to their business to really things that are closer to corporate investments targeted at M&A mm -hmm. to, you know, to individuals seeding companies that actually don't have very many venture characteristics to SoftBank, which really is playing a game that doesn't much resemble any of the games that the three of us are playing, right? So I think it's become a hard word to speak concretely about just because of the very, you know, the varied nature of what it entails. In institutional early stage VC, which is really the kind of piece of it that I've always been in and feel kind of best equipped um, to talk about, um, I think it's evolved in a couple of ways, um, largely having to do with capital available. Um, one is this idea of what is your defensive asset? And I think there was a period of t time where the defensive asset was the amount of money you could have and the amount of money you could raise. And so people kind of muscled businesses um, into scale because you could have a balance sheet that was a protective force. I actually, I, I don't think we're seeing a bubble pop, but I think we're seeing that trend shift. I think we're seeing a demand for unit economics and a demand for proof of business fundamentals earlier in an ecosystem overall. But because of the sheer amount of capital, it's sometimes hard to get that signal from the noise because there are people who will write checks about other things too. But for the institutional VC, I actually do think we're kind of seeing a little bit of a shift and a pullback there. Because there's so much money and because the definition and the category is so broad, is it harder to find those kinds of companies in this environment? Not really if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, because I think the, the, the benefit of time here is there's pattern in what those look like. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also the sheer amount of quantity of companies has increased in the last 10 years, right? As we all know, I think, you know, I um, grew up in New York City and, and went to College East Coast, and I, I don't think venture capital was on my radar at all. And, um, you know, you talk to high school students now, and they're very, very aware of startups and innovation and it's just become part of the vernacular of this you know conversation so early that it's fueling a lot more companies mm -hmm. so there's that but in terms of the real kind of fundamentals you're looking for i don't think it's harder i actually think in some ways it's getting clearer mm. yeah I, I would i think what you talked about before the distinction of institutional vc is an important point um because it is so broad but one of the things that has changed within institutional vc too as because there is so much broader capital, is that the round sizes have changed, right? Like you can actually draw a line from what an average, call it Series A. I mean, the, the words now mean nothing, but okay. like what an average Series A was in, in 2008 and what it is now 10 years later, I mean, it's gone up by almost three times, uh, just the sheer amount of capital. Um, so there's a narrative around that with cloud computing and AWS, we don't need a, you know, we don't actually need the hardware, we don't need the upfront cost, but that's not actually what you're seeing. Um, and it's, it's interesting, but part of it is just like the sheer amount of capital, the fact that there are more companies, and then people kind of coming to battle with more. So it's, it's interesting. I think that's true, particularly on the average, which we talk a lot about, right? So yes. like the average Series A, 
the average seed round. But the interesting thing about venture always is that this isn't a business made on averages, it's sure. a business made on outliers. And when you look at the success in the industry in recent times, right, what is the successful consumer company, and I mean success on an outcome and exit basis, not on a markup basis, it's actually pretty clear that capital efficiency is really valuable there, right? You see Stitch Fix that didn't raise a lot of money. You see Chewy's, which is insane, the yes. economics they were able to produce off of that kind of capital. And you look at the averages right now in terms of what these rounds look like, and you gotta wonder if that makes any sense, right? If it lines up with what we're seeing outcome companies actually resemble. Yep, but it's happening across the ecosystem, across sectors. Another trend that actually, I think, benefits all three of us is that the entrepreneurs are becoming much more savvy about what they expect from their from their capital sources, mm -hmm. and so they you know they're they're doing more diligence. They're expecting more. They're expecting that you're going to deliver value, and they really want to understand the value that you're going to deliver, whether it's you as an individual and the firm that's behind you. And I think um, they're only going to get more um, more discerning on that front. So they come in better prepared as well. Yeah, and also thinking about, I mean, I think founders today are, are thinking about how they construct their rounds and, you know, thinking about their rounds, not just the round that they're, cre that they're raising today, but mm -hmm. also their additional rounds going forward as well. What's the most common mistake, Ellie, that entrepreneurs make, that, that people who found companies make when, when they're talking to you, that you hear them say or do and you're kind of like, oh, not again? Oh, um, I mean... It's interesting. So we, we talk about this um, occasionally, but I feel like there's so much information out there now about what people want that this is getting better. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with the pitch process. It's not very transparent. It's pretty inefficient. Um, but some of the things that you can glean out of it is just the back and forth and starting to understand how you're going to interact. Um, if I push back on something, do you get defensive or do we have a conversation about it? You know, is it is it actually something that's constructive? Because at least it's an indicator of what things could be like later, because things don't tend to get better when you get, you know, then when you're post investment <laughs> and stressful things happen, and you know you've got a first board meeting that maybe goes well, maybe doesn't, right? Um, usually doesn't. It usually doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we have a major reality check. Yeah, yeah. Usually there's some surprises, um, but uh, you know, so. Usually, it's not necessarily the specific question. It's like I, when you're showing a financial plan in a, a Series A pitch meeting, um, I don't expect that you're getting amortization right in year three, and I don't care. Um, it's really a sanity check and a conversation that we're able to have about, you know, do you understand the levers in your business? And you know, when we talk about different alternatives, are we able to have a substantive conversation? Um, and the other thing that, that usually rears its head in is around competition. Um, and if you're flippant about um, nobody else is doing anything like us um, or you know, really dismissive um, versus making the assumption that the people who are actually competing with you are intelligent, capable humans. Um, and just b making sure that you've really thought about it and um, you know, are able to, to discuss it intelligently. How far apart are the expectation levels between entrepreneurs right now and the funders, the sources of capital, given where we are, given how much money is sloshing around out there, Beth? Um, from a valuation perspective? From a valuation perspective. Yeah, I think, I think in some cases there's some, there's some subsectors that are pretty broad. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, you know, if you're interested in that company, need to really think about sort of what the actual outcome can be and to, to try to bridge that gap. Let's talk a little bit about some of the business, some of the pitches that do come through, and what gets you excited. Um, you guys hear tons of pitches. Um, Rebecca, I forget you. How many pitches do you hear a week? It's about a thousand ish a year. Mm -hmm. So something really needs to stand out for you to remember. I'm gonna do three. Three out of a thousand per year. About yeah. Okay. How about you, Ellie? It's pretty similar. I might write more seed checks than she will, uh -huh. so the number might be more, but the capital is fairly similar. Okay, Beth? Yeah, it's about the same. So in terms of themes, <clears throat> what has legs? Well, where are the opportunities? I, I know that all three of you deal with the consumers, uh, the con consumer side of the businesses, for instance, and Beth, you've talked about how e-commerce is still underhyped, which I found really interesting given how everyone's worried about Amazon taking over the world and Amazon being this e-commerce giant. How can it be underhyped if everyone's scared of, of competing against Amazon? Well, I think there are certain ways that Amazon Amazon is obviously an amazing company. They still are predominant the predominant 
e-commerce player in the market, but there are ways that there are things that they just don't do well. They don't do brand well. Um, they they um, you know quality when they're creating products is sometimes or even selling products is sometimes questionable. So you have an opportunity as a brand to be able to articulate that 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 quality and and um, and present that quality to your consumers. Mm -hmm. um, you can't really discover on Amazon. And so if you're going in and saying, I need an outfit for Saturday night, that's not a search you can do on Amazon. But there may be branded places online that you can actually do that. Um, and, th and the fourth is curation. And so a lot of businesses that we're seeing are about putting, uh, making your life simpler and uh, limiting the amount of choice. And so those are, those are just four ways that the companies in the consumer space mm -hmm. can compete with Amazon. Rebecca, you talked about this shared wallet where people are putting more money into health and wellness, understanding that they need to shell out more money themselves in a way that they didn't have to before. Yeah, I think one, you know, um, at my previous firm I did only consumer. The kind of lens is open widely, but I do largely consumer. And I find that one way to kind of narrow the field and to think about what interests me there is to study this share shift of a consumer's wallet, right? So where are people putting their dollars today that say they weren't 24 months ago? And I think you know health and wellness is something that's now talked a lot about. But if we think about where we're investing time and money, I think that's quite a big bucket. And I think about it in a couple of different ways. One, I think the spread of knowledge, information, and data around what matters to us and what can affect us um, is encouraging that. Uh, I think there's just general trend in the industry about it. And, and I also think um, there's kind of awareness in the health system overall that we're going to have to be responsible for ourselves yep. and that we're going to have to take a lot of our long being, you know, long term wellness into our own hands. And um, I think there are going to be powerful brands that emerge out of that uh, that are going to help us do that. So it's a category that we're spending quite a bit of time in. Ellie, you talk about how certain healthcare organizations are now viewing patients as consumers, which is something they didn't really do before because they got paid by insurance companies. And that changes the way that you look at companies that cater to consumers, healthcare consumers. Yeah, it's something that people have been talking about for quite some time now that it's more of a value-based system and consumers are increasingly in high deductible plans and actually starting to care about cost. It's taken longer to actually work its way through, and it's not like it's a tomorrow thing. Um, but you are starting to see the beginnings of thinking about the customer experience as the patient as the end consumer versus the health system versus the doctor um, versus all of the other cogs in the ecosystem. So you are starting to see um, companies that are probably still selling B2B today, mm -hmm. um, but maybe they're selling to an employer, and then ultimately it's B2B to C because they need pickup within the within the consumer base of the employer, but they're really trying to differentiate around the full experience, and I think that's really encouraging because you're starting to see um, kind of some of the consumer characteristics translate into a better experience of care. And you see, Ellie, um, opportunities in consumer packaged goods, which I thought was interesting given that you have so many giants in the business. You have Unilever, you have yeah. Procter & Gamble. So how, how is there room for a smaller player to, to enter this market? Yeah, um, well I think you've seen already a handful of, of outliers do pretty well between the, the dollar shaves and even there's a company called Native um, that isn't necessarily in the tech ecosystem but was an all natural deodorant brand that basically bootstrapped and got sold for a really nice number to P&G. Um, so there are we're seeing a ton, actually, across kind of healthcare CPG, and some of them are subscriptions that are, or a lot of them are subscription, and a lot of them are actually uh, need a prescription. Um, but they're still going direct to consumer. Some of them are focused on one product. Some of them are focused on many products. Um, but it's something that we've seen quite a bit of over the, over the last 12 months, and I think we're going to see an awful lot more um, going forward. So I think it's going to be a good area. Right. And in fact, Beth, uh, Firstmark uh, works on or invested in Hubble along with with Ellie's Graycroft, right? Yeah. Which is a contact lens company mm -hmm. provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's exciting about that business is one, it's subscription, but two, there's a regulatory mode around it. Mm. And so it's not easy for other entrants to come into the market. Right. Yeah. You have a bit of protection there. So those are areas that you're excited about. What about themes that have um, that are tired, that are played out, that when someone comes to you, of the 1,000 pitches you hear per year, or someone tells you about, you kind of just roll your eyes at, and you can't believe that they're really trying to make a play for this. Beth? Well, I don't know if that's <laughs> my reaction. <laughs> okay, inside, that's what that's you're thinking. That's yeah. what she does. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we've seen, um, you know, over the last couple of years, I've probably seen almost 300 
AR and VR companies. And I think there are still some really interesting applications for this technology, but there's a, there was a lot of money and a lot of companies chasing after this over, over the last couple of years. We're starting to see that sort of, I don't want to say correct, but sort taper of off. taper off a bit. And so I think there will be um, some great companies that will come out of it, but from the standpoint of the number of companies chasing after it versus the number of companies that will actually break out, it's it's a, a more lopsided than some other this industries. This seems fairly controversial given you've got some of the biggest Silicon Valley companies heavily invested in AR and VR. Yeah, which you're, you're seeing very high valuations and um, not as much traction as you thought that they would have. And I think part of the reason why it's harder on the venture side is because you're seeing some of the biggest mm -hmm. Silicon Valley companies so invested in AR and VR. And I think one question we always have to ask is why is this something you're going to beat Facebook in, right? If they're heavily invested here, what is your advantage to win? Yeah, what's your special distinction mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. Ellie, what about you? What do you, what do you hear from, or what kind of pitches do you hear where you think this is not gonna work, wrong timing? It's less about if this is not gonna work and it's more about is this gonna be a venture outcome, right? right. Like is this going to be a good return as we would define a good return, which is different than most of the world. And like there's a lot of companies that, that just shouldn't that. be venture backed. I mean, it's just a risk reward thing, and the venture, you know, the venture asset class is looking for, um, you know, just much, much bigger outcomes. So it's not a three x. You're not excited that you made three x on a deal. That's not really moving the needle on a fund. You're, you know, you're when you look at something, you're asking yourself, can this be ten x? Can this be, you know, can this really be meaningful? And can this be, you know, a major contributor to fund returns at the end of the day? Um, of course, that varies a lot depending on um, the stage. You know, if it's growth, it's going to look a little different than if it's really early stage. But there's a lot of businesses out there that just shouldn't be venture backed and shouldn't be forced to grow unnaturally and shouldn't be kind of looked at within that lens. Um, that could be perfectly nice businesses, but should just have a different source of capital. Um, so there's a lot of businesses I see that look like that, and that's across sectors. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the sectors I would say that you know is just tough right now to get investor attention, including us, is ad tech, which I know is a little bit of a third rail in New York because there's a lot of it here. Um, but it's really tough to actually build a big defensible business um, unless it is you know truly unique and truly differentiated. And right now we haven't had a new platform breakout where that is going to be a possibility because really it's going to be an incremental, you know, whether it's you know slightly less latency or some other some better black box algorithm that's going to be able to serve a better ad to somebody else. I mean, it's just it's really tough. And to Rebecca's point, it's something that Google and Facebook are so good at and do so well in uh, right. that. And as it concentrates it? and yeah. more of the power concentrates there, it gets increasingly difficult. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the New York world because you mentioned how the ad tech and New York are kind of combined here. Um, all three of you are based in New York. Um, talk I, live a little. In San I live in San Francisco. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you're That's a native okay. New Yorker. I am. And you've come back. Union Square Ventures is a <laughs> New York-based company. <laughs> That's right. You spend plenty of time here, Rebecca. I do. Um, <laughs> New York is a smaller ecosystem than Silicon Valley. What, what is the definition of success in the New York venture scene versus in Silicon Valley? You know, I think the definition of success increasingly is converging, which I think is, is a very important thing to happen in New York, right? And I think, you know, even in the last uh, year or so, New York has seen very powerful outcomes. I think, you know, Flatiron Health um, recently is a very powerful outcome for New York, MongoDB. Um, you know, there's it's, it makes it really interesting. And I think where I'm excited to see New York go, and that I the difference that I see here is um, Silicon Valley is structured to dream very big and to have a definition of success that fuels support for the irrational and for the idea that, you know, I always put it this way, like when, you know, Facebook got that in, that billion dollar acquisition offer from Yahoo, if they were in New York, would they have taken it? And I think we've seen a little bit of that in New York, yep. that you're in, an in, you're in an ecosystem where that is such extreme success, which it is, like I'll take a billion dollar outcome all day long as an investor, um, <laughs> but it does that prevent some companies 
from feeling the pressure to be the $10 billion company and to be the $100 billion company. And that's um, important to have in an ecosystem, not only for the financial results and the equity value results, but for a lot of things. Um, those are the companies that create pillars of an ecosystem that fuel the talent. Mm -hmm. If you think about the percent of innovation in Silicon Valley that's come out of Google and Facebook and PayPal, um, sometimes as whole teams, um, and, and fueled that ecosystem there, it's really, really meaningful. And I don't know that New York has had as much of that yet. I think we're headed in that direction. Um, but I think, you know, the first step is to have a whole bunch of these, you know, billion to $2 billion outcomes. And I'm excited to see some of these become the more pillar kinds of companies of, of New York. Mm -hmm. Brad, what do you think? No, I think that's absolutely true. I think we're just starting to see the second generation of entrepreneurs here in New York build businesses and go after those those big outcomes. Um, but you know, we're it's a smaller ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think there's some things that are great about New York. We're a much more diverse ecosystem, so you have lots of industries here where you know companies that are in insurance or fintech or in media like are they can pull from the other industries to staff their companies, and so which Silicon Valley doesn't have. And I think that's why you're seeing a much more diverse workforce here than there is in Silicon Valley. We have you know, more women in the tech sector. Um, I, on a percent basis, we probably have more women VCs here. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's all positive. So I think as we're growing the ecosystem, it's, it's, it's coming from a base of more diversity. And so hopefully those, the structural pieces that we don't have here to create, those, create the mindset around bigger outcomes mm -hmm. will come over time. Ellie, do you think that New York is a better place to be a, a female VC than, than Silicon Valley? That's like an impossible question to answer. Is it more conducive? Um, is it a more conducive environment? Um, I have no idea. I don't have an A-B test, frankly. I've only <laughs> been here for the last seven years as uh, you know, a, a venture capitalist here. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know, the ecosystem as a whole, um, you know, things are getting better. There are numbers are increasing. Um, but I feel like it's still so early, and we're getting excited about tiny increases. It's still pathetic. I mean, it's just well, in like... in some cases, the numbers are actually not moving. Yeah, <laughs> that, that too. In some cases, they actually aren't. But the, still, it's like, you know, being heralded that the, that the number's moving by, you know, a percent or two. And, and that's when you're starting at 7%, you know, getting to 9%. I mean, that's good, but, I mean, that's, it's still bad. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there, I think there, things are going in the right direction. Um, and, and hopefully, um, you know, that will continue and that momentum will continue and that, you know, it will become a financial necessity um, because that's what actually will drive change there um, when it actually hits the bottom line um, across whether it's fund returns or within companies. Um, you know, th that's, what, that's what actually moves things. Beth, I want to come back to you for a moment because um, Rebecca talked about how Silicon Valley is where you dream irrational dreams, dream big, go big or go home. It's been said that women are more realistic, they're more grounded in their objectives and their desired outcomes. When they make pitches, they're, they're looking to, to ground it in something that's uh, feasible. Men, it is said, have more room to be ambitious and to, to come up with, you know, reach for the stars when they're, when they're giving um, their projections, even if it seems unlikely. So does this point of view or approach work better when you're an investor or an entrepreneur? How, how does it play out? So um, you know, half of my portfolio at WME was women. And I'd say that from a, from a broad strokes, that statement is true. So you have more realistic, view, more realistic views on what's going to happen, more detailed plans on how to get there. Um, and, um, and not that that means that they're not dreaming big, but they're sort of a, um, is sort of a fallback on what we see generally in, the, in all industries that men are generally judged on um, potential. potential and women are judged on what they've actually been able to do. So I think there's part of that is sort of how women have gone through sort of their, their work lives and you know, how, what happened. Um, and you know, on the men's perspective, I mean, look, like as investors, we're gonna we're going to make our own decision based on 
what we perceive they're coming in with, right? So if I know that you know this detail plan is pretty solid, we might not discount that as as much, right? But if you know if there's no, you know, here's a PowerPoint, and we're going to be, you know, a twenty billion dollar company in in five years. You might discount that, you know, and and think about that in your evaluation. Rebecca, what do you think? Um, I think overall, those kind of very broad stereotypes are probably have accuracy to them. But I think it all loops back to the same question of, of who's around the um, investor table, and here's why. I'm not a fan of saying, well, women may be more rational in how they present things, so what we should do is teach them to speak in a way that's different than that, right? right? And talk more, because effectively what you're saying is, well, we should teach them to be more like men, um, because that will get the pitch better, and that's done. And I think we're compilations of lots of things. We're compilations of our gender. We're also compilations of our experience mm -hmm. and our backgrounds and our where we grew up and all these kind of different things. And all of that comes across in these nuances of how we present and the way we talk and how we calibrate risks and rewards. And I think the most important thing is to have a table and have an investor table that's going to understand nuances of people and are going to be able to take the, all those in and say, OK, they're presenting different than someone else, not necessarily because of the business, but because of who this person is. And that may have weaknesses in how they're going to perform as an entrepreneur. And it also probably has great strengths. And you can't do that if an investor table looks all the same as each other. Right. You can do that when there's diversity around that table. And I think increasingly, as we can do that, we're going to be able to appreciate that people pitch in different ways and bring different things to building a business, rather than look at that as a problem. Ellie, biggest advantage to being a female VC, a female venture capitalist? Again, I don't have an A-B test. I have not been a dude. I bet it's awesome. I bet it is great, really. I mean, you just don't, yeah, I mean, I can think of so many reasons why that would be awesome. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, I mean, obviously, there are, you know, women are the consumers of an awful lot of, um, you know, we're the decision makers yeah. of a, a tremendous amount of, of the spending power in the economy. And, um, you know, in, there's a lot of end markets where I don't need 30 minutes of education to understand the need and understand the end market. Um, and it's something that I'm able to translate for everyone else around the table if, if perhaps others don't. Um, but, you know, there are a, a number of things, particularly on the consumer side, but not just that. I mean, think about healthcare and think about all these other things um, where, you know, just having an understanding of, um, what it is that they're looking to solve and, and have that be something that you just, you come to much more clearly and much more quickly can absolutely be an advantage. Um, and so if you can find those opportunities that others are going to ignore because they're going to discount um, what that actual need is or what that actual problem is, then great. Beth, what do you think is the biggest advantage? Well, you know, look, anytime, and this happens less and less, you know, as you get further in your career, but anytime that you are underestimated is a huge advantage, right? So it's a huge advantage in competing for a deal. It's a huge advantage to from the standpoint of the the rest of your cohort, whether you're in an investment banking class or whatever. And so you use that as, you know, I think that there's a lot of tools that we have that we can use to our advantage. That's one. Um, I think we, we talked about this earlier from the standpoint of this is a this is an interpersonal business and we build relationships differently than men. And so if we can create stronger relationships with entrepreneurs or other investors in the ecosystem, those are all things that are huge advantages to us. Your network might look different and be made up of different kinds of people. And the relationships there are different as exactly. well. And the way that we do diligence. I mean, you know, having a network and being able to connect with people that are not just the, the, the entrepreneurs we're investing in <coughs> and the other, other venture capitalists in the industry, whether it's, you know, product managers or other people in the ecosystem that we can check things with. I think those are things that we're also building sort of a deeper relationship within the organization, okay. within the ecosystem. Um, I mean, these I, th I agree with both Beth and Ellie. I think being 80% of consumer spend is really powerful when you're a consumer investor. I also think, um, look, what a VC's job is to do, at the best deals, you're often um, you're selling, not buying, right? You're often competing to win against others. And being memorable helps. Um, yep. You know, there's a lot of VCs that look really similar to each other, and what they can bring is really similar to each other. And there are a lot of them are really great. Um, but you know, I think the it, does it sometimes not work in your favor? Sure, but oftentimes it does. Um, 
for better or worse, they're going to remember me when they walk out of that room because I'm a little bit different than the other people that they talk to every day. And I maybe can bring something a little bit different, um, a different understanding of their market, a different network to the table. And I am a believer that enough of the time and increasingly enough of the time, that's going to be a good thing. And that's going to play to the favor. And then the other thing I would say is um, I'm a big believer that the the Female VCs on both coasts um, do not have the numbers yet. We don't have the quantity yet, but the quality is enormously high. Um, and maybe that's because it's been a harder industry to get into. Maybe that's because they had to climb through um, kind of a maze of a career path that wasn't always so obvious. But it's a very, very high quality and high caliber group of people. And I think there's a real commitment among us to support each other and to um, help each other's career. And I felt that very, very strongly in mine um, among other female VCs, um, like great mentors, great friends, great thought partners, um, great co-investors. And I um, do a lot of, you know, men have great networks too, I'm sure, and, and their own thing. But I think this is an asset that we can yield as a weapon. And I think, you know, we plan to do that. As evidenced by the three women we have on stage. All right, let's open things up to the audience. Raise your hand if you have a question for one of our panelists. The gentleman in the back against the door, if we can bring him a microphone. And let us know if the question is for anyone in particular as well. Hi there. I don't think it's on. It's on. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, hi there, my name is Arjun, like Argentina without the Tina. Um, <laughs> I just have a million right here. Uh, my question to you is, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned a, a little bit about mentors. Um, I wanted to see who were your mentors and what did you learn from them? And following on, did you invest in anyone, a founder, who eventually became a sort of a mentor to you because you learned something from him or her? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely um, to both. So, you know, I talked a little bit about Bill Campbell, who was my real original mentor and, and a mentor for so many. And I think I learned a lot about what great mentorship looks like, including a lot about follow through on it. Um, I then went to a firm called Navron, where the partner who had started that firm is a guy named Dan Levitan. Um, and he has been a huge mentor to me. And from him, I really learned um, what it's like to take a real people-centric approach to this job. And that you can be a student of markets, and you can be a student of businesses. But if you're not someone that can sit across the table and build a connection that's emotional and personal, um, with the entrepreneur on the other side of it, um, it's not only probably going to be less valuable, it's going to be less rewarding. And I, I, that really matters to me. And, and he really lives and breathes that. He's an awesome guy. Um, I find I've learned the most from a lot of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with. I think you know this is a business where you can kind of like talk your talk because you hear other people say it until you viscerally understand it. And a lot of that has come from companies I've worked with. So I think about like Joey Zwillinger, who's the CEO of Allbirds, and how much I learned from him around what it means to grow an organic brand and what it means to build a product that customers love and how to not only say you're customer-centric but really leave and breathe it. And I don't know, it's been a huge mentor in how I think about consumer businesses. All right, next question. Thank you. Uh, woman in front here with the jacket, if we can pass the microphone over to her as well. Right here, third row. Hi. Um, so Ellie mentioned that ad tech was like an oversaturated market, which I think is true. But also, um, working for a consumer brand, do you guys ever are you guys ever worried when co companies are Facebook focused or Facebook and Google focused, and could that ever change? In which like Facebook and Google can't reach customers anymore, and how are consumer brands still going to reach their customer base? Yeah. It is something I think all of us talk about a lot. Um, I think that the search for diversity of channels will never end, right? Um, so if Facebook's working for you, that's great, but people live in fear of the algorithm change and then it you know, starts getting more expensive, right? Um, people have lived through it on Google. They've had entire businesses um, that were you know, gaming one particular piece of the algorithm that suddenly couldn't get back up. Um, so certainly being dependent on any one platform is exactly that, it's a dependency. Um, so you know, I think most brands, every brand really, is kind of constantly looking at the data and trying to understand what other channels there are, um, constantly experimenting and, and constantly even just iterating on what's working on the channels, right, as I'm sure you know. Um, and as the channels get more and more concentrated, I think you've seen what's happened um, with a lot of the publishers and, you know, the challenges that um, have really grown out of that. 
Um, now the brands are actually buying advertising, uh, which is a little bit different than you know looking for more of the free distribution. Um, but it's certainly something that everyone pays attention to, and you know having uh, concentration on any one channel is is always going to be a risk. But most brands look similar in that they all have dependencies on something. Can we get a question from this side room, uh, gentlemen over here in the third row? Hello, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Do you believe that the uh, legal case between Ellen Powell and Kleiner Perkins helped or hurt the role of VC and women? Sorry, women in VC. Beth, why don't you start? Um, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think um, I think that the way that the the um, case played out uh, did not help um, women in VC. Uh, I think it started, it, it was important because it started the dialogue and put a stake in the ground. And I think it was important in the evolution of what's happened over the last couple of years. But that the immediate outcome of what happened after that was, um, was not great. So what's the takeaway? Um, I think that the way that she was painted in the press and in the, in the and it seemed like she was a, tro a, a troublemaker. Um, causing waves was there there was question around um, the specific evidence in the case and so you know that's hard for any of us who were watching the case to actually understand which way it was because obviously there's lots of lawyers and you know Kleiner has you know probably the best lawyers out there um, and so uh, I think that that was that was challenging um, and it took it, and I don't think that that, it started to put a light on some of the issues, but because the outcome was that she lost and because the outcome, or because she was portrayed the way she was in the, in the case, it was, it was a little bit challenged, right? And so it became, I think we already had a industry that wasn't super enthusiastic or seeking to work, work with women and that wasn't something that was con a contributing factor to help change that. Yeah, I think that in, I think that all of us write, I think that in the rewriting of all this, when it's less fresh, it will be viewed as one of the first things that started this broader conversation, and that's how it will be viewed. Um, so 10 years from now, it'll be like, well, we had the Ellen Powell thing, and then we had um, Susan Fowler's Fowler. memo, and then we have this, and it will be like a factual timeline. Um, and all of this nuance will be lost, which is true when it was a day by day, you were looking at it, you were, you were reading it, you were following it, and you were living the reverberations of it. So I think it's, you know, we're still at a moment in time where we remember that, and I think that's gonna get lost. Did it affect the way you did business, or that you heard pitches, or that you interacted with anyone in the industry, Rebecca, while the, the trial was going on and these dribs and drabs were coming out? Look, I think news cycles are relatively short, as it turns out, in this industry. Um, for, you know, things are extremely controversial and very hot, and then the people are on to the next thing the other day. And I think um, the lesson I've always taken down, what, something I like about this job is when things are crazy and lots going on, I know what I got to do tomorrow, which is I have to meet entrepreneurs who are building businesses, figure out what I'm excited about, and convince the best ones to be my partner. And um, that has nothing to do with really Ellen Powell and Kleiner. And so the short answer is no. The longer one is it's an important conversation and I think anyone in venture, man or woman, has to think about what what their intersection with that conversation should be and what is their role in, in this industry in helping solve a problem. And I think that case was um, that case was about whether something was legal or not. That was a lawsuit. The conversation we're trying to have, and I think one of the tricky things is is not really about what's legal or not. It's about how a gender should be treated in a job and the opportunity that they should and you know should have and whether or not they've had that over time and how we can change that. Mm -hmm. And when that's framed in a legal light, it's not always the best light to actually have that conversation in. And so it was a weird place to start it. I think we're doing better today than we were then and that makes me say. Yeah, it gets awfully narrow very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Another question from uh, this woman in the third row over here. Uh, Kate Brodock, Women 2.0. Um, thank you all. Uh, one quick side note, Ellie, some of us actually are already on the timeline you just mentioned. So good news. Great. <laughs> yeah, we're there. Um, so last year, a little bit on that point, but diversity in the tech space was a big thing. Um, 
uh, traditionally work has been done in that and the nonprofit side. From an investment standpoint, I'd be very curious to know what you feel. Is there anything in the sort of diversity tech space, anything you know, in terms of analytics, um, barring um, recruitment and hiring, that's sort of a little bit of a different beast. But do you think there's anything there while companies start thinking more seriously about this? You know, IBM just um, sued Microsoft because their, uh, their chief of diversity was leaving and that, that, you know, data is leaving their company. It's like a, it's a resource and an asset. Do you think there's anything there from an investment standpoint? Are there venture scale opportunities in the diversity yeah. space that we could and, back? And, and it, maybe there's something specific. Is there, are there companies that could come out of that, um, which again has traditionally been in a very sort of squishy, um, you know, nonprofit, do good CSR space. Opportunities? Investment yeah. opportunities. It's a, I, I think we're seeing some. Um, you know, I think you're seeing uh, there's a handful of things at the seed stage that are focused on um, kind of anonymous reporting of, um, of harassment across the enterprise. It's not specific to sexual harassment, anything like that. It's really more to give, there's a few different takes on this, so I won't talk about any of them specifically, but you know, of the four um, that are, are generally to give kind of management as well as boards a, a look at culture within the company. So think of it like glass door, but, of a, but a slightly different take. So you're seeing things like that. Obviously around hiring, which you mentioned, you are seeing different things. You're seeing uh, different coaching platforms. So I think we'll continue to see more. I don't think there's anything obvious that I would point to today. I mean, one thing that I'd say that I would be looking for is I think we've seen a lot of companies that are about the reporting and making reporting easier. I don't actually think that's the problem. I think the problem is, is that HR is set up in a way and reports into the company and that's hard to report. So unless there's teeth to that piece or like a third party um, that administers that HR right. function, we're not going to see a lot of change. Or there's some, you know, what some of these, you know, kind of take on this reporting is it like that they're actually reporting to the board or attempting to do so in order to take that out. Whether yeah. or not that works and whether or not people care are two totally different things, but yeah, you, whether or not you're venture fair. is the right funding model for yeah, 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 is exactly. another question. Exactly. Is another yeah, question. yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, let's go to the woman in the back who's standing up. Can we turn up the mic for her? Hi, my name is Millie. My question is for companies that want to scale, like go 10x, and they're not exactly in the tech hemisphere, but they want to be um, a valuable company to a VC, what would be your advice for them actually growing quickly? We'll have to take that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get to 10x? Uh, I think I understand your question, which is, um, so I, I think with any company, I think um, growth can't be something you put on top of it, right? That you, you have an idea and then you say, well, I want this to fit a venture model, so how do I infuse growth into it? It has to be part of what that company is. And so what I think about is from the genesis, what is that growth mechanic? What is native to this company of what the product or service is that I'm building that makes it set up to grow? And if you want, and if the goal is to be a, a venture scale company, to grow at an exponential rate. I think it's very hard to take an idea that already exists and implement that model on top of it. And, and that's not to say that companies that don't have that model can't be enormously valuable. Many of them can become more valuable over just a longer time period. So part, a way to rephrase what I heard in your question also is, is this the right company for venture? Or what other funding model should I be thinking of that might be a better fit for a company that I'm building that might become enormously valuable but might be working with a model that's not exactly aligned with the venture model? What would be some of the other models, Beth, um, where you could get funding maybe not through venture? What are, what are alternatives? Oh, uh, oh, you mean where, where else you can get funding? Yeah. Um, I think that there's, there's a, a variety. There's you know, other asset classes that don't have the same lens of growth and multiples that we're looking at. Um, you know, some companies we see have great businesses and even have cash flow, so you can go and get, you know, a bank loan or debt, you know, other forms of debt. Um, 
you know, there's uh, individual investors, there's angel investors. angel investors, family offices, others that have longer time horizons for their, their investments. Um, and that could be actually great strategic partners for you. Um, some, some corporates too could be potential sources as well. Yeah, and there's crowdfunding um, and there's that works for, you know, there's some point. that are kind of sector specific. Um, so, you know, there's, that's a, a newer way to access capital, but certainly one worth looking into. All right, final question for this woman over here, uh, right at the end of the row. Thank you. This was quite a dynamic and um, exciting presentation, and it's wonderful to hear all of you speak. My question is, in terms of your portfolios, what percentage of your female entrepreneurs um, are working with uh, strategic differentiation in terms of machine learning models and global partnerships in terms of scaling, uh, so U.S. and global strategic alliances, and how uh, do you view that in terms of your valuations? And obviously, there are a number of other variables involved, but um, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts. So those are two separate things. Machine learning and then are taking a global approach to their markets. So I, I guess I would, I'm, I'm happy to answer the question. Um, the context is, I'm not sure that those are the lenses we look for in terms of how we assign value to companies. We more assign value to what is the market you're tackling and are you doing that in a way that is going to win the market you're in? Because it doesn't always make sense for a company to be taking a global perspective so early in their journey. So, we, so I'm not sure that that's... Yeah, I just mean it wouldn't be always something we would assign a positive value to, depending on uh, the company and the priority it has. But I would say, you know, machine learning has become, um, we're not believers that a lot of companies are machine learning companies in the core function of what they're doing, totally. but a lot of our best companies have a machine learning capacity to them that they're using as a kind of weapon in their market. Um, actually, particularly our female founders now, it's actually probably quite a high ratio. Yeah, I, I would say along the same lines. It's like people talked about mobile in 2009 um, or 2008, right? It, as though it was a vertical when actually everyone just had to deal with it. Same goes. Um, <laughs> I know, like it needed to be able to react, and like it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a vertical. It wasn't a sector. It was just, you know, it was a horizontal thing that everyone was going to, you know, be able to leverage and have to respond to. And I, I view that the same way with um, with machine learning. It's not we're investing in this machine learning company most of the time. It's rather. Um, you know, how people are actually using the techniques to make their particular business better. Sometimes it's a business that could only be possible because of machine learning, but not always. Beth, any thoughts on this? No, I mean, I completely agree with, with what they're saying. I think, you know, there's a, beyond machine learning, I think from an international and global perspective, we see companies doing that way too early in their, in their trajectory, so we, you know, take caution on that moving to other markets. That might be All right, I'd like to ask Cornell Tech student Julia Hawkins now to come up and uh, give some closing remarks here before we say thank you to everyone. Julia? Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Hawkins, and I'm an MBA student at Cornell Tech. Um, on behalf of Cornell Tech, we would love to thank um, Rebecca, Beth, Ellie, Scarlett, and Karen. Um, Cornell Tech is very proud to be partnered with Bloomberg and Tech NYC to put these events on. If you're not familiar with Cornell Tech, we're a graduate program on Roosevelt Island in New York City uh, that focuses on advancing the art of, te in, of technology in students and in New York City. Like Bloomberg, we are the brainchild of Michael Bloomberg. Uh, core to our curriculum is a program called Startup Studio, where the seven graduate programs, so spanning from engineering to LLMs to M MBAs, form teams together uh, to start a company. And a few of them spin out um, with funding from Cornell Tech. So we're along our journey right now, and so it's really fortunate for the students to be able to take a break and come here. Your guys is really inspiring uh, stories and your fascinating perspectives on the state of the venture world. So thank you. Um, if you want to know more about Cornell Tech, um, I'd be happy to talk to you if you're staying for the happy hour. You can also find more information about Cornell Tech on our website or visit our campus on Roosevelt Island. So one last thing, the next Cornell Tech at Bloomberg event is March 26th. 
It'll be with uh, Eva Chen from Instagram here at Bloomberg. Thank you for your time, and I'm sorry we ran a little bit late. <laughs>